on this edition of Independent Sources, Not So Fresh Direct, the battle to keep the food delivery company out of the South Bronx because of environmental concerns. We should not have to balance job creation with the ability to breathe clean air. Mm -hmm. Who else has asked that dynamic? And beam me up trying to improve the city's air quality with a device that personalizes pollution monitoring. When people are armed with that type of information, then they can go ahead and present it to, you know, their community representatives, their elected officials, and hopefully make some change. Those stories and more coming up on Independent Sources. Welcome to our special Earth Day edition of Independent Sources. I'm Sarah Pison. This week we'll focus on some of the environmental issues affecting Southeast Queens, North Brooklyn, and the South Bronx. That's where we'll begin, in the area that has the highest rates of asthma and asthma deaths in the country. The group South Bronx Unite says this is a major reason they don't want Fresh Direct to build its corporate office in their neighborhood. I spoke with the group's co-founder, Michael Johnson, about their fights with the food delivery service. Michael, thank you for being with us today. My pleasure, Sarah. So your organization, South Bronx Unite, is currently fighting the arrival of Fresh Direct. Why is that? Well, we've advocated against and fought against this relocation plan since it's it started back in 2012. Mm -hmm. This project was announced as a done deal by mm -hmm. our Governor Cuomo, then Mayor Bloomberg, and our borough president, Ruben Diaz, mm -hmm. as a done deal two days before the very first public hearing. Mm -hmm. And as, as a community member at that time, a community board member, you know, we didn't know a lot about what this project meant. We knew Fresh Direct was a, a home base or home delivery business for groceries, mm -hmm. so a warehouse to your door groceries. Mm -hmm. And we, did, we also understood that they primarily use diesel trucks to make that delivery happen. Mm -hmm. And because we have such high asthma rates and really poor air quality in the South Bronx, we need to know more about this project and what it actually would mean mm -hmm. to our community. I mean, not only did the community members have questions about it, but so did our local elected official, uh, city council, then city councilwoman, uh, Melissa Mark Viverito, who's now the speaker, mm -hmm. um, questioned this project and asked for it to be slowed down, with the vote not take place two days you know, after it been being announced as a done deal, and so we can find out a little bit more about what it would mean, um, especially in the overburdened community. Right, so Fresh Direct declined our invitation to be part of this interview, um, but they provided the following statement, so I'm going to read it in part. It says, Fresh Direct trucks will represent a tiny fraction of the vehicle traffic in the area, form one of the youngest and cleanest fleets in New York City, 93% meet or exceed the stringent 2010 EPA emission standards, and emit less air pollutants than older model trucks that are more common in the community. The company has committed to creating a thousand new jobs, many of which will go to Bronx residents. In fact, we're pleased to share that we have already hired a hundred new employees from the Bronx and are planning a job fair there in the coming months. So what's your reaction to, to that statement? Well, there's a couple things in that statement that I believe are questionable. Mm -hmm. First of all, you know, they're tiny or small incremental increase in what we already have. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have five bridges leading into our community. Mm -hmm. We have uh, asthma rates eight times the national average. Mm -hmm. We have one in four of our children have asthma. When we started our fight against this relocation three years ago, one in five had asthma. So only mm -hmm. even an incremental increase from what we already have, and when they say incremental, they're talking about a thousand daily diesel truck trips throughout our community every day. From their own acknowledgement, from their own documentation submitted to the city for these subsidies, mm -hmm. it showed approximately 938 daily diesel truck trips throughout any area in which they're located. And we're saying we can't take that additional burden. I mean, how much more do we need to take as a community mm -hmm. before it's understood that we have an epidemic? We have some of the highest mortality rates due to asthma or due to air quality issues. Mm -hmm. Our community is encircled by highways and has one of the largest industrial business zones in the city. Mm -hmm. We have some, some 850 acres of our waterfront land from Mott Haven, Port Morris, and Hunts Point is a significant maritime industrial area where for decades our community has been used as a dumping ground for industri industry mm -hmm. to supposedly create jobs, right? But we still have some of the highest unemployment numbers in the city. So they haven't created the jobs. Mm -hmm. But what they have created is this really poor air quality issue and some of the highest as rates in this city and probably in the country. Mm -hmm. And due to their promise of job creation of 1,000 jobs, they would receive more than $100 million if they didn't create one additional job. 
And this money in which they're being offered is taxpayer subsidies. Mm -hmm. It's monies from our pockets as state, as state and city residents to bring that amount of traffic to this community and to rely on a 21-year-old environmental impact statement to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, and then they say they just hired 100 employees. I just want to go on each one of your checkpoints. Um, we don't know when they hired the first employee supposedly from the Bronx. I'm, I'm pretty sure they've always had employees from all five boroughs. And they should, as any company, hire people from wherever they live. Mm -hmm. You know, but we should not have to balance job creation with the ability to breathe clean air. Mm -hmm. Who else has asked that dynamic? And so what, are, what have been your victories against, um, against this battle? What has been the battle like? Well, you know, it's been pretty hot and heavy. Mm -hmm. And it's good because... We're planting the seed of change in the South Bronx. We're saying you can no longer treat this community the way it has been treated. Mm -hmm. I mean, from, like I said, the highest, the largest industrial business zone and largest in, uh, significant maritime industrial area in the city, mm -hmm. but also we have largest amount of, 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 of waste transfer stations mm -hmm. and fossil fuel power plants, right? <clears throat> what so is, that needs sorry. to change, and that's what we're working on changing. Yeah, I was going to ask, what is the next step right now for your organization? Yeah. Well, you know, we sued the city, we sued mm -hmm. the state, we sued Fresh Direct, we mm -hmm. sued the leaseholders of the land who've had a lease on this land for the last 20 years mm -hmm. for a 99-year period in which it's public land. So what, we, what we're what we saying and what we've done is we've been able to build a coalition, right? We started off as residents, some allies, and some organizations coming together mm -hmm. to start South Bronx Unite Coalition. Now we're more than 51 organizations mm -hmm. who've come to come together. Now we've grown and we're still growing. Mm -hmm. You know, we've grown throughout the Bronx itself, not not just not just citywide, but the Bronx from Riverdale to the South Bronx. We're working together on environmental justice mm -hmm. and social justice issues in the South Bronx and the entire Bronx. So I think we're coalescing around the need for change mm -hmm. and the need for real community input, not this fake stuff where, you know, you can say it's a done deal and then have a public hearing. Mm -hmm. That should not that's not a democracy. And I know that you attended a panel a couple months ago mm -hmm. about making sure that the South Bronx is um, making sure that the businesses that set up in the South Bronx are going to be eco-friendly, basically. Yes. So um, you're talking about this battle, and, and tell us about this ongoing battle, not just towards Fresh Direct, but towards in general, towards the businesses that want to set up shop in yeah, that area. I think, you know, we have to look around the city at different models of job creation, mm -hmm. a lot of which are happening all over the city, including Manhattan and also Brooklyn, mm -hmm. where they're not asking that question if you should be able to breathe or have a job. Okay. They're not asking the question that we should balance environmental, environmental issues or environmental impact mm -hmm. versus job creation. They are do, cur, they're creating green jobs, what, real, real jobs that are providing mm -hmm. you know, living wage and also healthy to the community in which it's going to be in. And so that's what we're looking at, and that's what I would think, and a lot of our coalition partners are looking at is saying we need a different model, not just industry, not just warehouse mm -hmm. jobs for the Bronxites. And why is it that we're only good for warehouse workers and delivery people? We can do tech. There's other things that are actively out there that are job, and job creators that are being funded by our city mm -hmm. need to be funded in the South Bronx and in the Bronx overall. So you're overall optimistic? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I think the seed of change always happens from the ground up. You know, this trickle-down uh, affects everybody. It doesn't happen. We haven't seen the effects of trickle-down economics in the Bronx. We've seen trickle-down uh, hurt and assault on our air quality, but the change is going to happen from the people. You know, and I think that's the change we're looking for will happen from us. And that we'll push our elected officials to come behind us and call us around us and be true advocates of the people they represent. Great. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. Ah, my pleasure. Still to come on the show, why the Department of Sanitation is resisting the effort to curb the amount of garbage being transported through some poor communities. staying tuned to our Earth Day special. Earlier, you heard about the effort to keep Fresh Direct out of the South Bronx because of air quality concerns. Now we'll tell you about the growing campaign to cap the amount of garbage being transported throughout the city. The City Council is considering a new bill called Intro 495 that would do just that. But there's some controversy brewing. Abby Ashola spoke to Sarah Crean of the website The New York Environment Report 
about the debate over waste equality. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. So intro 495, it's a bill that seeks to tackle the issue of waste equity. Yes. Tell us what exactly waste equity is and what this bill is. Well, waste equity refers to the fact that in New York City, you have three large neighborhoods, the South Bronx, North Brooklyn, and Southeast Queens, which handle on a day-to-day -day basis at least 70% of the city's trash. That's residential and commercial. So those three areas are taking the lion's share, of, lion's share of the city's trash and then transferring it onto long haul trucks out of the city. Um, and the waste equity bill tries to address that in two different ways. It, and this, get, this begins to get kind of into the weeds, but the weeds are significant because of what people are dealing with in these communities. The waste equity bill, first of all, puts a cap on the amount of capacity that exists in those three communities and, and limits it at what exists today, the actual, based on what is actually being processed. Um, and then the second thing that the, that the bill does is it limits the amount of waste, the amount of waste handling capacity that could exist in any community board in New York City. There are over 50 community boards and the bill says that no board can handle more than 5% or can host more than 5% of the, the city's waste handling capacity. Okay, and council member Reynoso, proposed, yes. proposed the bill. Correct? Yes, he is the main sponsor of the bill. He's from North Brooklyn. Um, his community has had a tremendous issue with um, truck traffic uh, coming from all of this waste, you know, coming back and forth to these waste processing uh, stations, these transfer stations. Um, and he's joined in that by Steve Levin, who represents other sections of North Brooklyn. But the bill also has support um, from other folks in the council, including um, Council Member Arroyo, who is, who is based in the South Bronx. Okay. With all this waste being concentrated in these neighborhoods, how are the areas being affected? How are the residents being affected? Um, I mean, the main, the main issue is truck traffic. So in, in the South Bronx, you just from the waste transfer stations, just from the traffic in and out of those stations, you have about two to three diesel truck trips per minute, you know, wow. during any given business day. And the problem is particularly acute in the South Bronx because they're not just dealing with the truck traffic from waste, they are also dealing with at least 15,000 truck trips a day into the Hunts Point markets. Mm -hmm and they live next to several major expressways and four power plants and a wastewater treatment wow. facility. So it, all of these things work together. But one thing that I just want to clarify that's important about this bill is that there's what is basically handled every day in New York City and then there's capacity, you know, how much the, these transfer stations could actually take in. And for example, in the South Bronx, their capacity right now is at twice what they actually take in. And asthma is a big issue there. Yes, yes. In the, in the South Bronx, um, and, and it, take a look at Bronx County, for instance, the death rate from asthma, the death rate from asthma is about three times the national average. The death rate from asthma in in the Bronx is the highest of any county in New York State. Wow. Um, and it's a very complicated issue because they're dealing with pollution, but they're also dealing with poverty. They're dealing with housing issues. Um, the, you know, there's kind of a complicated, you know, nexus of factors that come together to make their ability to withstand what they're being exposed to, uh, you know, very difficult. And how is the Department of Sanitation responding to the bill in particular? Uh, I mean, they, they on the one hand, they say that they understand the issues um, and, and they're very sympathetic to what communities are going through in terms of truck traffic. And they, you know, have, they're engaged in a multi-year process to move the city's waste processing to a network of marine transfer stations. So that's going to help a lot because it's going to start, they're going to start moving trash by barge, um, but in terms of capping waste, like putting a legislative cap on it, 
they don't oppose, they, they don't support that. Why? And the, the reason for that is because they, you know, they want, that's a city agency that wants every possible tool that it can have in its toolbox. And they point out, for instance, that during Sandy, you had days, weeks, where the city had to use all of its capacity um, to get every, all of the debris out and to limit the amount of capacity that you can actually have. And they really would be cutting back on capacity in these three communities. Um, to limit that puts the city at a disadvantage in case of an emergency, in case of a natural disaster. Mm. So issues like this, is it only taking place in poor communities? Because we know that most of the waste is being processed in these three communities. Yeah. Is that it? Is it happening in other areas at all? That's an interesting question. I mean, I, th I think, you know, if you looked at New York City 10 years ago, you could definitely say, yeah, this is really about um, communities of color and this is about working class and poor communities. I think in the case of the South Bronx, that is still very much true. North Brooklyn is going through massive, massive gentrification. So you have this interesting dynamic where you have a lot of people who are much more affluent coming into an area where there are serious environmental challenges, particularly um, this issue with the transfer stations. Wow. So what's next for these communities and this particular bill? I, I think what's next in terms of the bill is, you know, uh, Council Member Reynoso, Council Member Levin, you know, they are actively talking to the administration. They're also talking to the waste industry. And, you know, if they, if they can't get the administration to support this bill, then, you know, they have to they have to think about a plan B. But I think that we're not at that point yet where they haven't, you know, really been able to, we're not at a point where they, they've said we just can't reach a, a solution. They're, I think they're in the negotiation process right now. For the communities themselves, this is, it is an ongoing dilemma of how to deal with truck traffic because waste is a big part of it. But as, you know, I was saying before about the South Bronx, there's a lot of other facilities that are also creating truck traffic. And the city is taking other steps to control the amount of pollution that's coming out of these trucks to make them cleaner, you know, having them run on electric hybrid, having them run on other types of um, diesel fuels. And the other issue for these communities is they are taking matters into their own hands and they are trying to figure out what the air quality levels are like at the person-to-person -person level, not the monitors at the tops of buildings or that the city has about 12 feet above the ground, you know, we're talking about giving kids monitors hmm. and having them walk back and forth to school and seeing what they're being exposed to. Wow. And that already has been done, but there's, there's more and more data collection at the ground level, and that's really, I think, really significant in terms of fleshing this picture out. Okay. Well, unfortunately, I have to wrap it up here. Oh. <laughs> Sarah Crean, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Our previous guests both mentioned the initiative to clean up the city's air. In this next segment, Gary Pierre Pierre speaks to Michael Heimbinder, the executive director of Habitat Map. His company has devised a portable air quality monitor. Michael, why was it so necessary to create this device? Uh, so the air beam, which is the black device closest to you, uh, measures air quality, this one right here. So these are earlier prototypes of the same device. Mm -hmm. Uh, and every major city in the United States has issues with air quality. And this instrument in particular measures PM2.5, which are tiny, tiny particles uh, that are floating in the air that can get into our lungs, and they're so small they can get into our lungs and pass through into our bloodstream. Mm -hmm. uh, so having something like the air beam allows you to assess what your air quality is like moment to moment, uh, day to day, week to week, month to month. Why is that important? Uh, because air quality has a big impact on our health and quality of life. Uh, asthma and bronchitis are some of the short-term health effects of exposure to air pollution or high, air, high concentrations of air pollution. And then there's also long-term health impacts, uh, cardiovascular problems, cancer, heart disease. Mm -hmm. And uh, how does it work? I mean, um, do you, who wears this and how do you wear this product? Yeah, uh, so uh, I'm the executive director of a Brooklyn-based environmental health justice nonprofit called Habitat Map, mm -hmm. and we developed the Air Beam uh, because we work a lot with schools and community-based organizations uh, that have air quality concerns, uh, and so uh, so it was important for us to develop something that was 
low cost mm -hmm. and accurate. How much and that is was it? something. Uh, it's two hundred dollars via That's Kickstarter. <laughs> yeah, why well, no? Surprisingly, but a comparable instrument mm -hmm. would be around five thousand okay. uh, dollars. So there was a big difference between uh, what was currently available on the market and what we developed here with the Airbeam. Mm -hmm. And so when when you uh, measure the air quality, then what happens? Mm -hmm. Do you so, run away from that neighborhood? <laughs> or? So you'll see it in real time on your Android phone because mm -hmm. it connects to an Android phone. Of Only Bluetooth. Android. No, Only Android. No, no, yes. Uh, app, Apple. Uh, uh, we Mac? would love to do it for iOS too, but there's uh, licensing restrictions in terms of Bluetooth connectivity okay. that you'd have to pay for, and then you doubles your cost oh. of uh, so, software. So uh, it's on Android. So how yes, does you it can work? see it in real time mm -hmm. on your phone. It maps it, so every second a colored dot's laid down, and that colored dot corresponds to the uh, the co the air quality in that spot. So if mm -hmm. it's good, it's green. A little bit worse, yellow, orange, and then red for when the air quality is not so great. Mm -hmm. And so in real time, you can see it mapped. And then you can also see the graph over time. And then when you're done recording, you can upload it to the, the website, aircasting.org, where it gets crowdsourced. So you see your data mm -hmm. combined with all the other aircasters who have gone out and taken air quality measurements. So you start to build a crowd map that's showing where's the air quality good, where is it bad. Well, speaking of that, are there a specific area that you've mapped out? And is, if so, why? Uh, so, like I said, we, we're a resource organization, so we provide resources to other organizations. One of the organizations that we've partnered with recently is the Newtown Creek Alliance. Uh, and the Newtown Creek Alliance represents uh, people who live in and around Newtown Creek, which is the dividing line between North Brooklyn and Western Queens. So it's Greenpoint, Bushwick, Long Island City, and this is a part of the this city. A, that's traditionally I've had a lot of environmental challenges. Exactly. So this is the largest industrial area in the city, zoned industrial. So you have the largest concentration of waste transfer stations carrying, you know, exporting garbage on tractor trailer trucks. You've got oil storage and distribution facilities that are bringing in gasoline, heating oil, ethanol. And you've got uh, the city's largest sewage treatment plant. So there's a lot of sources of air pollution in and around Newtown Creek in these neighborhoods. And it's a concern for the residents. Mm -hmm. And so what are some of the long-term and short-term goals of uh, of this project, uh, the long term goal is to get people, uh, you know, in touch with what's happening in their airshed, and have it not only happen here in New York City but really around the world. Uh, so when we ran a Kickstarter in November and we and we successfully raised over fifty thousand dollars to produce the Airbeam and send them all over the world. So there'll be people air casting in India, air casting in China. So yes, we have air quality concerns in the U.S. and those are very serious, especially depending on what neighborhood you're living in. But you can imagine it's a it's a magnitude order of magnitude different if you're talking about Beijing or New Delhi. Uh, so we're really excited to see what happens when we put a tool like this in the hands of activists, not only here in the United States and in New York City, but all around the world. Are you working with not only grassroots organizations, but with uh, organizations that can actually uh, make a difference? Yes, yeah, so one of the things that the city has been uh, pondering for a long time is the implementation of the Solid Waste Management Plan, passed in 2006 by the council, approved by the mayor, uh, and it's taken a long time to come to fruition. And what it means is that we're going to stop exporting all our waste by truck, and we're going to put it on rail, and we're going to put it on barge. And so we're very excited to see that happen, and in conjunction with that, see a shift away from truck-based, land-based transfer stations in neighborhoods like Greenpoint which is right next to Newtown Creek. Uh, also, I'm very excited to see that de Blasio has proposed limits on the type of wood you can burn in a wood-burning fireplace uh, and when you can burn it, and also regulations on uh, boilers and ovens at restaurants. Uh, you know, every little bit helps, and these are some of the things that have been proposed by the de Blasio administration that I hope come to fruition. You know, building out the marine transfer stations for garbage, controlling emissions from restaurants, uh, and residences. Uh, has the air quality in New York City improved? I remember when I was a kid, it was really, really bad. During the summertime, you can hardly breathe. Uh, scientifically uh, speaking, I, I think it's better, I mean, anecdotally, yes. but is it? Yes, ab you're absolutely right. Air quality f uh, in most major cities in the United States has improved uh, dramatically. Uh, particularly for certain types of pollutants. Uh, so one of the things that New York City did uh, that I was very excited to see come to fruition is they're phasing out dirty heating oil. So about half the homes and businesses in New York City use heating oil mm -hmm. and use this kind of stuff that was the bottom of the barrel, thick, sludgy, nasty stuff. And so the city basically said, the city passed legislation and the state saying, let's clean up heating oil, let's push the transition towards natural gas for home heating. And so we're going to see, and we're already seeing reductions in things like sulfur dioxide that are pollutants associated 
associated with heating oil. Uh, so you're absolutely right. The air quality is better, but we still have a long ways to go. Is this the beginning of a lo much longer uh, project, or this, you think, will be a device that's able to really monitor air quality and improve it? I, I certainly hope so. Uh, I'm really hoping to see, uh, you know, improvements, but basically if you have the data in hand, you don't have to depend on, you know, the city has 20 air quality monitors set up throughout the city, uh, and they're run by the state. And that's great. It's great to see that we're monitoring the air quality, but that doesn't, that's not representative of your exposures at your house, on your block, at your workplace. And so when people are armed with that type of information, then they can go ahead and present it to, you know, their community representatives, their elected officials, and hopefully make some change. All right. Well, thank you very much, Michael Heimbinder. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. When we come back, using art to bring attention to the world's water crisis. Finally from us, we'll take a look at a local project that's trying to draw attention to a global problem. It's estimated that 750 million people around the world do not have access to clean water. That's about two and a half times the United States population. One local artist is enlisting the aid of some like-minded creators to design paintings that will adorn water tanks along the city skyline. Zyphus Lebrun spoke to the project's curator, Mitra Korache. Mitra, thank you very much for being on the show today. Of course, thank you for having me. Okay, so let's just start uh, a little bit about this this water tank project. Mm -hmm. Why was it decided, um, why was the project started initially? Um, okay, so our founder, her name is Mary Jordan. She's a filmmaker and an activist and an artist herself. Um, she was filming a documentary in Ethiopia and she got sick, very sick, uh, for a waterborne illness. And then, um, like it was, a, she almost died, and she was nursed back to health by these girls. And when she was better, she was like, "What can I give you? Can I give you my jewelry, my camera? What can I do to pay you back?" And they're like, "No, do something about water. Raise awareness about the water crisis." Yeah. So she came back to New York, and she decided to start the water tank project. Now the water tank project. So let's talk a little bit about that in itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Let's, let's explain to the audience what exactly is the water tank project. So we're wrapping um, New York City water tanks with originally commissioned work of art by artists on the topic of water. It's an art and activism campaign to raise awareness about water as the most precious resource of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. So now, about how many tanks are... In know, our project? Yeah, are in the project. Um, yeah. We have around 80 tanks. Wow. Yeah. So that's 80 different, different works tanks. of art. Yeah. Okay, so if you can... Um, Tell us a little bit about, you know, what what are some of the, the pieces that are, mm -hmm. what do some of the pieces depict on, on these? Um, we have um, really established artists. We have younger emerging artists. We have um, high school students that were participating. We had a little competition with um, high school students where they could submit a proposal and then five works were selected. What are you trying to get New Yorkers to think about? When to the, think about the water crisis, change their habits, change their attitudes towards water. I mean, New York has one of the best drinking waters, tap water. And there's so many people in the world that don't have access to clean water, so mm -hmm. we're trying to use art to inspire. Right. Now, w where in the city are, are these located? I know you said 18. Right. That's a, yeah, that's a right lot. now we have 13 that are installed. Um, the 13 right now are all in Manhattan, but we're going to have them in all five boroughs. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so very much for being on the show with us today. And thank you for having me. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded.